we're studying the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, the last uh, lesson we got down, we ended up on goodness, and we got down to the word faith. Now, faith is the ability to trust God and be and to be trusted by God. Hebrews 11th chapter and 6th verse says this, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, we're to be trustworthy before God and man. We want God to trust us, and we most certainly must trust God. Every child of God should be faithful to God, not because the preacher says so, but because uh, that we love the Lord. And uh, that's, uh, you know, we see verse after verse in the Bible that tells us we show our love by being obedient. There's a story that I kind of want to go over with you that I read some time ago. And I copied it down. I don't know who wrote it, but when Lewis Laws became a warden at Sing Sing Prison in 19 and 20, the inmates existed in wretched condition. This led him to introduce humanitarian reforms, and he gave much of the credit to his wife, Catherine. However, she always treated the, the customer, I mean, the, the uh, prisoners in a human way, treat them like human beings. And she'd often, often take her children and sit with the gangsters and the, the murderers and the racketeers, and they'd play basketball and base, baseball together. Then in 1939, Catherine was killed in a car accident. The next day, her body lay in a casket in a house about a quarter of a mile from the institution. When the acting warden found hundreds of prisoners crowded around the front entrance, he knew what they wanted. Opening the gate, he said, man, I'm going to trust you. You can go to the house and see Catherine. There's, they said there was no count taken. No guards were posted. Yet not one man was missing that night. Love for one who had loved them made them dependable. Mm -hmm. This is a good lesson uh, to us as Christians. We really love God. We will we will be trustworthy before God. Yeah. Now we can uh, go in that that end of that much deeper, but we won't for the lack of time. We know that uh, uh, I think this is correct. The word trust is used 188 times in, in 188 verses. I maybe used more than once in a verse. 188 times in 188 verses in the King James Version of the Bible. And what we're going to know, what we're going to do this morning, we're going to uh, look at trust and what uh, it means to us and what it should mean to us as children of God. The subject of trusting God. Now, God allows us to have faith, to have trust. And it tells us that that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, having trust. Now, first of all, trusting God means that we accept God's word as truth and base our life upon his truths. The Bible is most important to us, so we should uh, stay in the Bible as much as possible. We should study as much as possible. Read it to benefit us as children of God. Now, that's I say this many, many times. Uh, just reading the Bible is not enough. We must stop and, and hear God, what he's saying to us, what he's telling us. He may be uh, admonished us, us to change our life in some way. He may be uh, praising us. He may uh, be giving us rules to live by, whatever the reason, that we should stay in the word of God. Yeah. Now, let's look at some of the promises God gives us from his word concerning the subject of trust. Trusting God gives us deliverance. Psalms 22, verses 4 and 5 says this, Our fathers trusted in thee, 
they trusted and they dis delivered thy dis delivered them. Deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trust in thee and were confounded. Confounded means bewildered, uh, confused, perplexed. Uh, many more words could be used for that, that word, but that's uh, primarily the meaning of it. You'll have to excuse me this morning. I'm, I took uh, a bunch of sinus medicine. They, uh, the allergies are really getting to me. And so uh, I may stammer around some, but uh, pray for me. Second Corinthians, uh, first chapter and the 10th verse says this, Who delivered us from great a death, and doeth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. We personally have to put our trust in God. His promises... And I, when we think of his promises, I'm thankful for that. You know, a lot of times, especially early hours of the morning, I might wake up and uh, I found that most of the time I'm in a kind of a negative mood, uh, mind wise. Do you do that? You know, I think about all the things that, that needs to be done. Or I may think about whatever. And it really, I really get troubled. And I found one of the best ways to re relieve myself of that that problem is go to the Word of God and start reading His promises. Uh, most of my Bible's got a lot of highlight in uh, the Book of Psalms. I thought I'd take the time uh, to go through the Bible and try to try to consolidate in the Bible that I'm going to die with. But I've got several Bibles that I use, and I'll highlight things, promises from God, and I'll go back and read some of those. And I found man. God blesses me so much from that. So we personally have to put our trust in God and his promises. And I'm forever thankful uh, that he delivered us from the penalty of sin. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, uh, the Manny, uh, Manny, that was his name, Manny? Yes. Uh, Indian, they, they came to church last week, got saved Sunday night. Uh, that's a that's a great blessing, but I'm so uh, I'm just uh, I'm in awe of what the, uh, that uh, the Lord did for us some two thousand years ago. Trusting God, and we're talking about the subject of trusting God. Trusting God blesses us. The second uh, chapter of Psalms and the twelfth verse says, "If blessed are all they that put their trust in Him." That's a promise from God. If we put our trust in him, he's, him, he is going to bless us. Promise from God. God keeps his promises. Now blessed, or blessed, as it is enjoying happiness, bringing pleasure, uh, bringing contentment, uh, bringing good fortune, but most of all, peace before God. Peace between you and God. But, uh, what a you can't be in a better place than having peace with God, and that's really when it, when you get right down to it, that's what brings us joy in this life, no matter what happens to it. Several verses in Psalms that, that tells us about this a blessing from God because of trust. The thirty fourth chapter of Psalms and eighth verse says this: "O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man that trusteth." In him. Going on to the 40th chapter. In the 4th verse. It says, tells us this. Blessed is that man that maketh. The Lord his trust. And respecteth. Not the proud. Nor such as turn aside the lies. Psalms 84th chapter. In the 12th verse says. O Lord of hosts. Blessed is a man that trusteth in thee. Jeremiah 17. 7 says this. Blessed is a man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And uh, most certainly in this world that we live in today. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Looking a little bit better in Ukraine, it looks like. It looks like they may be coming to terms. It's amazing. It's amazing what's happened there in Ukraine. Ukraine. But uh, 
there, there may be some improvement. Uh, we might see some light at the end of the tunnel as I was listening to the news this morning. I don't know. But you most certainly can't trust uh, the leaders of, of uh, Russia. Uh, it's uh, uh, They've done a horrible thing there. And uh, But uh, no matter what, uh, the Lord is our, our hope. The Lord coming back and get us is our hope. Well, I heard a preacher uh, from Baxter uh, a couple of a weeks ago talking about what a condition we were in. And he's talking about we surely are in the last of the last days. Yeah. No man knows, but I, I think that to be the case also. The Lord's coming back, and that is our trust. That is our hope, the Lord, God Almighty. Trusting God gives us hope. Trusting him gives us hope. Psalms 34, 22 uh, tells us this. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants. And none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. We, as his children, are hopeful people. Somebody, my question, uh, well, you know, the thing of it is, here's the thing. People really paint the word or the, the lies of Christians with a broad brush. <clears throat> they see some things on TV. They hear some things on the radio. They read some things in the paper. They look at something on the internet and they cram all that together and call it Christian. <laughs> uh, I, most of the things that I see, especially on TV, uh, is not from God. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I see a, a program after program. I watch them sometimes just to see what's going on. And they're saying, send me money. Send me money. And they're, they're saying in this matter, pledge something. And uh, promising that God's going to bless. And they'll, they'll get uh, a hundredfold return and so on and so forth. Never once in that whole presentation was the gospel giver. But they'll say this. They'll say, send us money so that we help us send the gospel around the world. What? You're not giving the gospel. So everybody, that, that word Christian is painted with a broad brush. As far as people's definition of what a Christian is. We also are looking at, at uh, looking at the Facebook a lot of times. And we, we see th examples where the people say they're Christian, but uh, they're involved in some things that's not Christian life. Being a Christian is being like the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, accepting him as your Savior, and then patterning your life after him. Psalms 36, 7 says this, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. I've, you know, I, I've I've got, had a lot of experience at my age, back when I was a child. I remember, and probably the Fortunatus has even seen this. I, I, a dark cloud had come up, and a clap of thunder just echoed. The old mother hen had raised up her wing, and the chickens would go under that wing. Somebody told the story of one of the fires, I can't remember which one it was. That a hen was standing and burnt completely up. All that was left of her was the bone skeleton, still standing. But the chickens was alive because she had them covered with the wing. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds like it's a possibility. So that verse tells us this under the shadow of thy wing. Now, how in the world could you be in a safer place? So we have hope. As a child of God, we have hope. He loves us. And his love and his grace is shown forth to us, his children. And I'll have a blessed eternal future. So God loves me. Now look at the 71st chapter of Psalm, the fifth verse. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. 
Thou art my trust from my youth. So, trusting God gives us hope. You say, in these troubled times, what's your hope? The Lord comes back and gets me. That's my hope. Uh, if I die and go to the grave, I'll go be with the Lord. And he'll resurrect my body one day. And uh, I'll have a incorruptible body. I've got a lot of problems now with this old body. You know, I just barely can't get around sometimes. And I can't get up and down. I've kind of made me a kind of made me a thing out of an old crutch. <laughs> to, when I'm out in the, in the garden or something, or out on the ground or something, where I can put some. I'm still strong in my arm, but where I can my arms can help me get up. I won't have that problem in heaven. <laughs> I'll be like a 21 year old. Yeah. That's pretty tough when I was 21. <laughs> you know, and that, but that, that time has gone by. No matter what, my hope is the Lord. My hope is the Lord. Now, trusting in people will let us down. I've been let down a lot by people. Uh, they, I've got this situation right now. I can't. I don't know what the, what the problem is, but uh, I try to find out. Can't maybe a relationship with someone, but maybe the Lord will show me. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have this uh, we have this uh, relationship problem with man is not trustworthy. People will let you down. Uh, even family will let you down. But God never will. Yeah. Trusting in God is an eternal thing. Look at Psalm 118, an eighth verse. tells us this. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. Yeah. So when you start thinking about the worldly condition we're in, I don't expect it to get better. The Bible tells tells us it's going to wax worse. Sure. I don't expect it to get better. It may there may be some reprieves. You know, we had a we had some reprieves in, in, in recent years. And I'm telling you right now, we're in, I don't have people of low income just barely getting by before all of this happened. How they're going to get by without starving to death? We're talking about people uh, either buying buying medicine. Or buying food. Now that's a few years ago. Now they, they're getting less money because everything went up. Right. You know, you know they talk about we're not ta taxing the uh, the middle class or the poor people. Yes, you are. When you tax, you know, when you raise when you when you raise the taxes anywhere, it's going to raise the price of goods. So who's paying for it? So we're in bad shape financially as as a country, the people in this country. But I don't expect it to get any better. Now, if you if you don't think things have went up, those people that's burning gas and at home, <laughs> heating their house with gas, just look at the gas bill and compare it with ice bill. Don't think things have went up, check your tax records for last year and what they were this year, and so on and so forth. Things are getting out of control. But I don't trust man will fix that. Matter of fact, I expect it to get worse. I expect maybe these high food prices will stay around forever. You know, when all this, if we ever get to the point that, uh, that the energy don't have any have any precedence over how much the food is going to cost, I don't think the food is going to go down. I think it'll stay where it's at. Maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but that's the way I look at it. But man will let us down. So I don't expect someone to come along and fix the problem. Maybe it'll get a little bit better. Thank God for that. But God will never fail us. If we trust in him, he'll never fail us. Also, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 26, chapter in the third verse, it says, God gives us peace. Thank God for the peace that he, he's given us as his children. Even in looking at the tough situation we're living in today or whatever might come in your life. 
He still gives us peace. I'm thankful for that. Isaiah 26, 3 said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts us in thee. Now, everything's not going to go our way. We're going to have troubles in this world. Now, there's certain people that you might see on TV or something and say, you do this and you'll just be, you'll just live and, and you'll just live and, 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 and blessed, blessed condition. That's not the way this life is. Every one of us, and it doesn't matter who we are, if we're children of God or not children of God, we're going to go through trouble. But God can give us perfect peace through all of that. Yes, he can. Now, God also gives us safety. Notice what he says, Proverbs, the 29th chapter, and 25th verse, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. How many times in my life have I trusted people and they failed me? <laughs> I know one situation where a guy stood up right in my face. I didn't say that. I never promised to do that, or I didn't do this or do that, so on and so forth. This is black a lie as you could be told. But anyway, that's that happens. Man, man will fail us, but God will never fail us, and He'll keep us in perfect peace, and He'll give us safety. Now, also, God trusting God keeps your courage up. You want to be courageous? Courageous? Just trust in God for courage. <laughs> Notice what it says in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, 16th verse. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. <clears throat> now we, as children of God, trusting in his word and acting upon his word gives us courage. Remember, and I have to remind myself this continually, remember anything God promised, he will fulfill. Uh, if he, uh, he tells everyone of the Christians to give out to God, talk to others about their salvation, give out to God. Be concerned, love. Don't you know when we go about doing that, it, he's not going to be there to help us. Sure. He's going to be there to help us. Now, we're not to act upon our own, but we're to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and dealing with people. Sometimes you can't be too hasty with people. You'll drive them off. Sometimes you have to get it while the iron's hot. Mm. Whatever. But let God lead and he will be there with us. And he will give us courage. He'll give us courage. He'll give us joy in following his word and following his command. Now, trusting God gives us strength. Isaiah, the 26th chapter, the fourth verse says this, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We have strength. And going on to, to uh, chapter 30 and the verse five, 15 of that same chapter. It says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, and returning and rest shall be, uh, ye shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall your strength, shall be your strength, and ye would not. Speaking of the children that didn't follow, but he said, if you would, here's what's going to happen. Trusting God gives us a foundation to grow on. Now, I know a little bit about foundations. I've seen some weak foundations that uh, that uh, cause structural damage and so on and so forth. I've seen foundations where structures just fail because of it. I've, I've seen instances on YouTube and some of those some of those other channels of those kind of situations. But what we're talking about here is he gives us strength if we'll just take his word and build upon where we're at today. 
Here's where I'm at today. Good. How can I be better? Good. Find it from God's word. Yes, sir. You build on that. You build on it. Hopefully, I'm stronger today as a Christian than I was last year. Right. And uh, uh, most certainly 10 years ago because I have studied God's word and acted on some of God's word. And so it's given me strength. And that's what this verse is telling us. <coughs> Shall be your strength. And God gives us that foundation, <clears throat> gives us a foundation through uh, uh, salvation. That must be the foundation we build upon. But he then wants us to grow. And we grow and get stronger in the Lord by reading his word and acting upon it. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, let's read 7 and 8. Blessed is a man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be a, uh, as a tree planted by the water and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall see from yielding fruit. Now, my total being is in his hand. Our, uh, you know, a lot of people, they kind of make you think that they're thinking they're going to live forever <laughs> and they're not going to die. Uh, and uh, we all are destined for death unless the Lord comes back to get us before we die. We're all destined for death and we're getting closer and closer. You know, I've got friends and neighbors and school uh, mates and uh, just gone, gone, gone on. Younger than I am. And, you know, Usually, you know, men die in their 70s and early 80s, so on and so forth. Just this was last week, I had a friend that passed away, 82. So we, uh, we're thankful to the Lord for giving us life, but we also need to realize that we are going to face God one day. And most certainly a person is not trusting in the Lord and waiting for something to cause them to trust in the Lord. I don't know what that might be other than uh, uh, following his His word, following uh, somebody's uh, uh, witness to them, whatever. But anyway, we're all going to die one day. It's uh, and time short. It's kind of amazing. I was thinking the other day, and I think I shared this already, but I was thinking, you know, I, I used to, I think 2,000 years, boy, that's a long time. And I'm thinking, I've, I've nearly lived 120 for that. <laughs> and so, uh, but the life is short. Yeah. And our being, our eternal being is in his hand. A person that has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ are in the hands of God. And you know what he says is going to happen to them? That they're going to end up in hell. Now, some of the uh, things that you see on TV about uh, hell and so on and so forth, uh, it, it paints a different picture from what it's really like. But just think about it. And this happens. But sometimes we don't come to this re reality in our mind. Being thrown into a fire that never ceases. <laughs> never burn up. Eternally. No hope. Right. Well, that behooves us to get right with the Lord. Yes, sir. And when I talk to friends, old friends especially, I I mentioned that quite often. I said, make sure that you're right with the Lord. Not a, not not just telling me you are, but make sure you're right with the Lord, that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Not not trusting on any of your good works. I know there, there used to be a lady that used to say, and she, she'd say, I'm going to be judged according to how I've lived my life. Mm -hmm. You're going to be judged according to to how we live our life, but it's after that we're a child of God. Uh, and it's going to be whether or not we, what we did for the Lord, we know that the good things will be rewarded. You know, the bad things that we've done outside the will of God will be burned up. We won't get any reward. But the thing of it is, people have got it in their mind they can live good enough, that they can do enough good things that, that God will show favor to them. The only way that a person can be a child of God is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. 
free. I mean, that's it way it is. Trusting in him for our salvation and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And our eternal being is in the Lord's hand. We're going to end up one or two places. I, I, I may have told this story before, but it was meaningful to me. They said after the Titanic had uh, sank, that they put a sign up, and uh, two signs up, and uh, Liverpool, India, uh, England. And uh, the, on one sign it said, people known to have lived and people that known to have perished. In other words, the people that's known to be saved, the people that's known to, to perish. You know, and I thought about that and how you could, that applicable that is to life. When we die from this life, we're going to be on one of those lists. Eternally lost, eternally saved. The way you get on the list of being eternally saved is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Not any anything that we can do other than trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I will finish up the next time. I'm going to quit there this morning because, well, let me do one more and then we'll, uh, we'll see where we're at. <clears throat> Faith, the ability to trust God. Well, that's so important that we trust God. We trust, trust his word. Okay, the next thing that we see in the fruits of the Spirit is meekness. Now, what does meekness mean? You know, we, when you think of meekness, you think of some, you know, spineless type person. Yeah, you know, it, that's not what meekness is at all. Meekness is having restraint. Meekness is being powerful and under control. Now, not using one's power in the Lord, uh, uh, for evil or for revenge, but the meek Christian does not throw his weight around. The meek Christian is a loving Christian. Now, Matthew, the 11th chapter and the 20th verse tells us this, that meekness, meekness is not weakness. A lot of times people, when they think of meek, they think it's about somebody weak. Jesus was meek. Let's see what it says about him. 11th chapter of Matthew, the 29th verse says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. The Lord Jesus Christ. We know how strong he was. <laughs> he commanded the, the seas to be still. He commanded the dead to rise. He healed the sick, but yet he said, I'm meek. And lowly in heart. Moses. Was very meek. But he was not a weak person. Notice what it says in Numbers. The 12th chapter. And the third verse. Now the man Moses. Was very meek. Above all men. Which were upon the face of the earth. So when we think about being meek. We think about being controlled. Restrained to do God's will, to do good to those around us. And we should, it shouldn't be considered as being weak. You know, following the word of God, being a person that will yield themselves to the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, change their life according to the word of God, that's been meek. Yeah. That's been meek. Following a love in nature. That's me and me. But not in weakness. Next we'll talk about temperance. Now temperance is having self-control. Refusing to do things that uh, you actually have the power to do if you want to. But refusing to do things because the word of God says not to do it. That's temperance. That's uh, following the word of God. Not following the flesh. You know, a great lesson to all of us. A great lesson to all of us. We all have a, you know, Brother Vic uh, brought this out in one of his messages. We we got a sinning body. We got a sinning flesh. And it is our job to get that under control. 
Sure. If you let the lust of the flesh have rule, you're going to sin. Right. And God says that you're not to sin. You're to be led not by the flesh, not by lust, not by the flesh, but by the Holy Spirit. I've said this many times. Probably thousands. If you're led by the Spirit and you're following the Spirit, the leadership of the Spirit, there'll not be any sin in your life. But we do know that we as human beings, we yield to the flesh sometimes. And we allow, allow sin to come in our life. That's the reason the Lord gave us a promise. If we confess those sins, he would be faithful to forgive us of that sin. And I'm thankful that he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. You know, if you go east, you'll never find west. If you go west, you'll never find east. You just keep going round, round, round. That's how far our sins are separated from us. I'm sure glad that they, uh, yeah. they didn't say the, the north and south. You go north, you go find the north pole. You go south, you find the south pole. And once you get up there, you'll be going south. <laughs> so, you know. That's not the case with east. You head east, you'll just keep on going. You just keep on going. So, God's word tells us not to do something. We're not to do it. And I know sometimes that we fail. Now, this is a, when we think uh, think about this, uh, let's look at First Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, and the 22nd verse. This is Tuffy. But we need to follow it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. What does that mean? It means probably we don't need to be watching any television. <laughs> I do. I have to ask forgiveness for it. <laughs> but I do. That means that you probably don't need to be uh, taking any direction from YouTube. Or the internet, so on and so forth. There's a lot of evil there. But that's, that verse tells us. That verse tells us. To abstain from all appearance of evil. If we even think there might be evil in it. Get away from it. Yeah. Separate from it. If you're thinking you're going down this road and you're going to run into evil. Get off of the road. Get on another road. Good that's what that means. Good to you. This is an attitude whereby life uh, is searched and to make and submit to the will of God. Make the decision that would be submittal to the word of God. That's what temperance is. Having self-control. All weights and all hindrances that we have we need to be laid aside. I got a, a message I, I took from a, one of my favorite writers. Uh, Getting rid of baggage. And uh, that's what he's talking about. If there's something in your life that is causing you to sin, get rid of it. All weights and hindrances that might be in our life that that would be uh, uh, a lead that would lead to sin. Just get rid of it. That means if, you know, for instance, I, I you might have a boat. You think, well, the only time I'm fishing on Sunday, I need to get rid of the boat. It's going to keep you out of God's will. Get rid of it. That's maybe a bad example, but that's what I'm talking about. Anything that might be there that needs, that would cause us to be to sin or to pull us away from God, get rid of it. Now, this is the opposite in the majority of, of lives. Well, I got this and I paid a lot of money for it and I, I'm going to use it. Or I bought this, uh, I bought this uh, getaway and uh, and I'm, 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 I'm going to use it because I spent a lot of money on it. But if it leads to not pleasing God, we need to get rid of it. Now, <clears throat> every, every child of God is commanded by God to render their lives as a living sacrifice. We all know this scripture, uh, Romans the twelfth chapter, first two verses. It says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your body to live in sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your man, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we just went, came out of Bible conference. A lot of effort. A lot of effort. That's many people. Most of the people of the church. Was put in place to make the place as spick and span as we possibly could. Get things in order. Apply that to our life. We need to get our lives in order. Because the Lord's coming back. We're standing before the Lord. He expected of us. As a matter of fact, he commanded of us to give our lives as a living sacrifice. Now, <clears throat> these things that we read about here cannot be counterfeited by an unbeliever. If you're going to please God, if you're going to get your life in in an acceptable and perfect will of God, you must be saved. So an unbeliever cannot cannot taste of that. It's absolutely impossible for an unsaved person to possess all the fruits of the Spirit. Now they may try to, and some people might convince you. But notice that these are not fruits. This is fruit of the Spirit singular. And only a born again child of God can partake of. You don't get one and then another. God expects them to be present in all of us. 